Hello, welcome back to another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric, and today we're doing another Lost episode. So I started this channel about a month after I got out of prison, after doing 11 years in prison, and I wanted to document the transition from a long-term prison environment to life in the free world. I wanted to document how challenging that was. However, after a while, probably after four-ish months of being out, maybe a little bit longer. I felt like a lot of my videos were getting negative, so I deleted a bunch of them. And I stopped recording for a while. But today we're going to continue the story um, of the Lost episodes. I've done a few of these already. If you haven't checked out those videos, go ahead and check them out. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get into this. Sorry for the lengthy introduction. I just you know I hadn't done one of these in a little bit, so I thought I would kind of refresh everybody on what we're doing here. So when I left off on this story, I had to go to Topeka. I was homeless. My buddy Robert and I were living out of a hotel. Um, you know, I had gotten kicked out of my mom's house, had no place to go. I stayed in a hotel in Emporia, Kansas, for a while until my money was pretty much running out. And then my buddy Robert got a hotel in Topeka because he was going to get a job in Topeka. He was going to work up there and we were going to find an apartment, you know, and we were going to be roommates and I was going to find a job up there. Robert had visited me when I was in prison and he was helping me make the transition to the free world. However, when we got up there, a lot of people would not rent to us or specifically, they would not rent to me because I had a felony on my record and I was on parole. However, I did have a house. It had been vacant for over seven years at that point, I believe. So it was in bad shape. You know, no plumbing, no electricity, bad leak in the roof, no furniture there. And around it, it looked like a jungle. So it wasn't really a house that I could just move into. But at this point, we're staying in this hotel. We can't find a place to rent. We're up in Topeka. He has a job, but he's not really liking the job. And I'm having a hard time finding a job. I found a couple of jobs, but they were only part time and they didn't really pay enough to even, you know, pay for my insurance on my car. So I also had that, you know, I bought this expensive car with high payments on it when I was working in Marion before I got kicked out of my mom's place. When I had decent money, you know, I, I got a, a decent car to get to work and now I had no income. So, you know, there was that. But I had this house in Kincaid, Kansas, which was probably two and a half hours south of Topeka and we kind of discussed it and said, Hey, look, maybe we should just move down there. You could find a job as a truck driver down there. There's all sorts of truck driving jobs down there, which is what Robert had done. And you know, I could find a job down there. We could fix up the house. It's something that we don't have to pay rent on or anything like that. We don't have to worry about a landlord. We can just go down there. You know, I can get on my feet and you've helped me out a lot. So you could stay at the house. You ain't got to pay rent or anything. You can stay as long as you want to, you know. So that's what we did. Now, the thing was, because there was no plumbing or anything like that, I could not just parole to this area and live in this house. I couldn't do it. You know, the parole officer would require that I have suitable housing, not something that has no electricity or running water. So I was going to go stay at Brandy's house, who I've spoken about in other videos. And so technically that would be my residence. I would spend most of my time over here at this house getting it fixed up. But for the purposes of parole... Brandy's house would be my address. In repayment for letting me stay at her house, which I could go there, you know, I could sleep there, I could spend time at, 
at her house, but I really wanted it to just be my residence on paper. I didn't actually want to stay at her house for any length of time. I don't like handouts very much. So it was just for parole. But as repayment for that, I was going to help out on the farm. Uh, Robert and I had to clean out an old computer room that was completely trash and messy and whatever. You know, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be that guy who sounds like he's being a dick and ungrateful, but the people who live at that house are very dirty. You know, they don't clean up around the house and they're just messy people. But beyond that, um, you know, I was supposed to help out. I was supposed to clean up the house and help out around the farm. And in return, I would be able to stay there. But remember, me staying there was just supposed to be a formality. I, I didn't actually want to stay there for any amount of time or that was the initial plan. So we get down here. I want to say it was late January, early February when we came down here. And we couldn't fit a lot of stuff in the Camaro. So I believe we made a couple of trips. We also got a RV. I had an old friend, um, my old math teacher from high school, actually. And I had stayed in contact with him while I was incarcerated. And he had a RV that he would sell me, but I didn't need to pay anything on it right that moment but we'd have to get it over to Kincaid and so we did manage to do that however it had a transmission problem so we ended up you know having to go 20 miles an hour from Olivet Kansas all the way out here which I believe took at least a couple hours if not longer and we parked that outside the house the idea was it had a generator on it and you know, we would have power or something, or at least a place to stay that had, you know, heat, it had water, it had facilities, stuff like that. And so we would have that. And it would make it easier to get my parole transferred to Kincaid from Welda as soon as I had all that hooked up. So we got the RV down here. We got most of our property down here as far as our clothes, you know, all that good stuff. And like I said, man, it was cold. It was brutal. You know, it was winter in Kansas, so it, it was pretty rough. And at first we didn't have power. We had to get the power turned back on. Uh, we accomplished that. You know, I, I was coming out here. Uh, sometimes I would sleep over at Brandy's, but, you know, a lot of times initially I was sleeping over here. I picked a room upstairs and I gave Robert the master bedroom downstairs. He's a big guy. I figured he could use a bigger room. And, you know, I was over here working on the house, trying to get it to where the power could be turned on. And then we got to that point. It took less than a week to get the power turned on. We got the power turned on and there was something wrong with it. We did not have good enough power to run a couple of space heaters even. You know, the space heaters would barely work. They put out very little heat. And, you know, we're talking February in Kansas. It was in the single digits to the teens outside as far as temperature went. Ice on the ground, snow on the ground. It was not pleasant. That was a bad thing. You know, we, we were cold. We basically had a, a bunch of blankets. And that was that. That's... You know, it sucked. I don't know how else to put it. It sucked. And, you know, Robert didn't have a job right away, and I didn't either. And I also was supposed to help out at the farm, so some days I would be over there helping out, and I wouldn't be here. And I felt really bad, because when I stayed over at the farm... Robert would be here in the cold and he set his TV up and he'd just be sitting in here playing video games, you know, in 20 degree temperatures, you know, with, with the dog and suffering. 
and there was no running water. So if he needed to use the restroom, we're talking about driving, you know, 10 miles over to Moran, you know, just to, just to use the restroom. And that sucked. That really sucked. And that was the next thing on my list, of course, was to get the, the water going, to get the water hooked up. At that point, there was no sense in trying to make the RV work because if our electrical wouldn't power a small 15 amp, well, it was actually a 1500 watt space heater, how, how the hell was it going to power a RV, you know? And the electrical system on the RV itself had some problems, you know, the batteries kept draining on it. So we couldn't just go in there and use that for a standalone electrical system. We could run the fridge in the RV and that was pretty much it. You know, we couldn't use the, the facilities in there like we initially planned on. We couldn't use a shower, couldn't use a toilet because our electrical would not run the water pump. And that sucked. Eventually, Robert got a job working for Bones Trucking. And so he was on the road every day. It was a job where he could come home every night. He had a dedicated route, you know, and he could come home every night and do that. But because it was so uncomfortable to stay here without heat, without plumbing, anything like that, he would stay in his truck. And a lot of the time after that, because he was at work constantly and it was cold here, so he didn't want to stay here at night. He wanted to stay in the truck at night. I was staying here in the cold, you know, it was, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 degrees at night, a lot of nights. And so Nelly and I would just go upstairs and hunker down underneath a bunch of blankets and hope for the best. Nelly, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? What? What are you doing? Nelly, are you dead? Is this your belly? Hey, Nelly. Nelly. What are you doing? What are you doing? You playing dead. Nelly. Nelly. What are you doing? What are you doing? You gonna beat me up with your ears? Hey. I don't need my face washed. What? You gonna say something? What you gotta say? What you say? Mm. What you say? What's up? You gonna talk to me? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Is that right? Is that right? Hey. Hey. What are you doing? Hey. You. I'll get you. I'll get you. I'll get you. I wasn't going to blow on your nose. You knocked over my coffee cup. Jerk. 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 I put in several job applications in the area. I applied at every Pete's within a 50 mile radius. I applied at Casey's. I applied, oh man, I applied at Walmart. Um, I applied at Russell Stover's. I applied you know, everywhere. And I wasn't having much luck. I was trying to hustle. You know, I had a bunch of jewelry from stuff that I made in prison and, and stuff like that. That was my hustle. When I was in prison, I used to make jewelry. So I tried putting some of that stuff on Facebook. 
and it didn't sell, you know. I tried picking up old stuff from thrift shops, like antiques and stuff, and tried to sell that. That didn't work. I was hitting a lot of dead ends really fast, and I was spending a lot of time here by myself in the cold, and I was trying to work on the house. I was crawling under, you know, underneath the house trying to work on the plumbing, and that sucked, and I wasn't making any progress. The one day that I really felt like I made some progress is uh, when I rebuilt the fire pit in the backyard. I was so cold one day, and... We used to have a nice size fire pit in the backyard when I was a kid here. But over the years, it became overgrown and the ring of rocks got uh, knocked over and stuff. And it just got filled in with dirt, I guess. But I tried to find where that fire pit was because you couldn't even see it anymore. And I went out there and I dug it out and basically rebuilt it out there in the cold one day and I did a pretty good job on it and that made me happy you know I lit a fire and I just sat there next to the fire getting warm and that was probably the first success that I had in a while it really was all right so here's a fireplace I rebuilt and I got a burn permit from the county and I am now enjoying a fire. Awesome. But after a bit, you know, I wasn't having a lot of luck on the house. I wasn't having a lot of luck finding a job. And I was just over here by myself when I was here. And I started spending more time at the farm and sleeping at the farm more and just staying over there. There wasn't any point in me being here and working on the house and trying to get it fixed up by myself and being here in the cold all the time when I could be over at the farm in the warmth, I guess. It's kind of short-sighted to think that way at the time. You know, I try to be pretty self-disciplined and put off instant gratification so I can look at a, you know, long-term goal. You know, try, try to look at the bigger picture begin with the end in mind, you know what I mean? But that's not what I did at the time. You know, I I was tired of being cold all the time and working on a house without getting anywhere. So I started, you know, working more at the farm, cleaning more, and I didn't really enjoy being over there because the people were very inconsiderate. You know, as soon as I would clean something, I, like I would go clean the kitchen, I would spend four hours cleaning the kitchen and then someone would come along right behind me and dirty it all up again. And I wasn't used to living with a bunch of people. I just wasn't used to living with a bunch of people. I suppose when you live in a household with people like that, you get used to dealing with stuff like that. In prison, you don't, you don't do that. If my celly were to leave the sink dirty or something like that, I was going to tell him about it. If he left dirty dishes all over the desk, I would tell him about it. You, you know, you don't do that because it's common courtesy and respect. You don't do that sort of thing in prison. And these people were doing this like it was not a big deal. And it was, frankly, it was pissing me off, you know. And I was already in a bad frame of mind. I lost a really good job. I got kicked out of my mom's house. I had to live in a hotel. And now I'm living out of somebody's basement. And I can't get my own house fixed. Basically staying in my own house without heat, without water, anything like that. It sucked, man. I was not in a good frame of mind. So I wasn't, I wasn't doing well with putting up with stuff like that. I was already pissed off. And I was kind of looking for an outlet to, you know, give me an excuse, basically, was where I was at. Give me an excuse to be pissed off at you because I'm pissed off at the world right now. So, <clears throat> I wasn't happy staying over there either, you know, and I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't doing a lot of farm work. Uh, March rolled around. I think it was March. And... 
Brandy got us a couple of Mustangs. One of them was supposed to be mine for a birthday present. And we were going to work with these Mustangs, train them, and then possibly either sell them or just keep them. Brandy had a bunch of horses. And so I started working with the horses, working with the Mustangs, learning about that, building fences. And it was a pretty steep learning curve for me because I had been around horses before. You know, my mom had a horse. My dad had a horse. But they were trained, broken horses. You know, it was very different. These horses that Brandy had slash has are horses that run around in a field all day. You know, they, they don't get worked with every single day. Um, so I wasn't used to that. And I had never tried to train a Mustang before. Mustang, you know, completely unbroken horse. It was captured in the wild, I think, a year before or something like that. And so I've worked with it and I, I tried to learn and, you know, I could have done more. I could have done more around the farm than I did. I just wasn't happy. I wasn't real motivated. I was trying to go out and find jobs and stuff, but I really felt like I was a failure and I was in the dumps and I was in my own head and I was letting stuff get to me. I was letting stuff kind of steal my fire, so to speak, you know what I mean? In the sense that I was letting situations tell me that I was defeated and accepting defeat instead of claiming victory. Because victory doesn't come easy. You know, you're going to find yourself in all sorts of really bad situations. And if you don't stand up and say, you know what, it's hard, but I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to push forward. If you don't do that, then you're just going to lay down and you're just going to give up. And I felt like I was getting close to that point where I was giving up. In addition to all this other stuff that was going on, this chick that was supposed to, you know, be with me when I got out, um, Jamie, she was kind of becoming more and more distant. She had no intention of coming and visiting me or anything like that. We weren't really talking much anymore. She kept saying that I was negative and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, cause she would ask me what was wrong because I wouldn't be in a good mood, you know, and she would ask me what was wrong on messenger or whatever. And I didn't want to talk about it, but if you ask me what is bothering me, I will tell you. And if it's, if it's bothering me, it's not positive. You know what I mean? Anyway, so she would ask me why I was in a bad mood. I would tell her and then she would criticize me because I was being negative. It's whatever, you know? Anyway, so she and I weren't really talking very much anymore. The positive things that I can identify when I was staying over at the farm, I enjoyed working with animals. I really enjoyed that. Also, Brandy's son, Grayson, was born the day that I got out of prison. And I was the only male in his life, and he really gravitated towards me. You know, we would hang out and watch TV together, or I would play guitar for him, whatever, you know. I just enjoyed being around him, and he enjoyed being around me. So that was cool. There were positive things there. In addition to being around Grayson, I was in easy driving distance of my sister Shannon, and... I got to go over there and spend time with her and her family, you know, my nephews and my niece, and that meant a lot to me. That was very, very cool and very important to me. Even so, as time went on, I, I felt like I was tired of fighting and I felt like I wanted to give up. I felt like I was about done and, you know. I didn't know what to do. The only person who believed in me uh, at that time, well, Robert believed in me, clearly. Um, 
Brandy believed in me. I had known Brandy since I was a freshman in high school, you know. But I didn't believe in myself, so it didn't really matter who believed in me because I didn't believe in myself at that point. I was very disappointed with my surroundings, my situation. I felt like I couldn't make any progress on the house. And I want to say around April 9th, <clears throat> I, I started planning on committing suicide. And I hate saying that because I, I don't like giving up. You know, I don't like admitting defeat, but that's where I was at. And I had planned on committing suicide on, uh, on my birthday. And I actually started putting together a slideshow that I was going to put up basically telling everybody, thank you, you know, for being a part of my life and saying that I was sorry. And somewhere in that time between the ninth and my birthday, my birthday is on the 21st. I actually got fed up with something and I was just going to go out and do it. You know, I, I'd been walking around, uh, with a bottle of sleeping pills in my pocket for, for about a week or two or something like that. And I had planned on just driving off out in the woods, someplace nice to look at, someplace nice and quiet and taking the bottle and going to sleep. You know, I'm a, I'm a car guy. And I'm a nature guy. I figured if I went out in a car surrounded by nature, that would make me happy. You know what I mean? But, I mean, yeah. As I was leaving, Brandy could tell that something was wrong because I was just sitting there in the chair, kind of retreating into my own thoughts and then I got up and took off and I was going to get in the car and Brandy came out and stopped me you know she didn't know what was going on she was crying she didn't know that I was getting ready to go kill myself but she knew that something was wrong but I kind of reflected and thought about the people that were around me that did believe in me, you know, and I thought about all the things that I had going for me. And I started looking back at this slideshow that I'd put together and all the people that I had these great memories with and how much they meant to me and how grateful I was to have them in my life, but also to be a part of their lives, you know? And if I committed suicide, I was basically saying, hey, I don't want to be a part of your lives anymore. And that wasn't true. You know, I, I did want to be a part of their lives. I just felt very, very defeated. So I turned the, uh, the slideshow into a thing where I wanted to give thanks to the people that were around me and actually the the picture on my youtube channel you know the little thing next to my name my profile picture i guess you could call it that is the one of the main pictures that i had taken for the slideshow is my final farewell because i didn't have any new pictures of me um that I liked. So I thought that would be a, a good picture. But instead of it being a final farewell, it just reminds me to be grateful to people, you know, be grateful to the things that are around me. Because when I took the picture, I was kind of looking off into the distance. And when I took that picture, I thought of it as, you know, this is me not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, not being able to see the end of all this, not being able to see over the obstacles that are in front of me. 
and I kind of changed my perspective to where that's me looking beyond limitations at what I'm capable of. Because even though I can't say for sure what the future holds, I can't say it's going to get better tomorrow. I can say that I am capable of overcoming the obstacles in my path. I can say that I'm capable of doing more to better myself. I am capable of bettering my situation. I am capable of making my life better. I am capable of making a choice to be happy in the here and now. And so that's what that picture is a reminder of. About a week before my birthday, Robert moved to Washington. I don't know, you know, I guess stuff was getting kind of rough for him down here. And without much warning at all, he went to Washington. Then it was just me, you know, and I got my parole moved. I kind of got into it with Brandy's mom. And I kind of, you know, hooked up the power to the RV to make it somewhat decent and I cleaned it up inside and made it seem that I had good electricity and running water and had the parole officer come down there and approve it to be my residence and I moved to Kincaid into that RV and that's where I was living still very cold very miserable it was not a fun experience but I was on my own finally no handouts and I also didn't feel responsible for letting Robert down. It was just me. Me and Nellie, that was it. That's all I had to figure out. And to cut down my responsibilities to just that made my life a lot easier. It made my life way better and way more manageable. So that's where I was at. Winter time. Actually, I guess at that point it would be early spring, which is still pretty damn cold in Kansas. But that's where I was. Early spring in Kansas with an RV with minimal electricity and no running water and no job. But a week after deciding not to end my life, I went and... I did a an 18-mile bike ride with my nephew, Jimmy, and I had a lot of fun, you know, and it made me realize it's not about all the things that you can't do or all the shortcomings or failures you have. That's not what makes life what it is. It's about experiences, the experiences you have and the people that you have those experiences with. That's what matters. So it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. It's dark outside. I'm sitting outside looking at the stars. It's a beautiful thing to just sit back. Take the time to notice the simple things in life. Sometimes we forget to do that. You know, oftentimes... We worry about being accepted by others. We worry about being good enough for somebody else. At the end of the day, what matters is that you're trying your best to do what's right for you to progress, move forward, and to grow. Progress isn't about achieving perfection. Progress is about being more today than we were yesterday and about being more tomorrow than we are today. Moving one step forward at a time. The idea that we need to meet other people's expectations to live up to the standards of another is a falsity. We should strive to do the best that we can 
And when you go to bed at night, if you can sleep with the knowledge that you're good enough for yourself, good enough for your higher power, whatever that might be, that's what matters. When you can go to bed at night and you know in your heart that you've done everything in your power to do something better for yourself, and that you've done the best that you can with what you've been given. That's what matters. So if the world doesn't like you, if the world doesn't approve of who you are, screw the world. It's not about the world. It's about you. Don't get so caught up in your problems that you forget about the little things. Like the stars. For a number of years, I lived in a place where the lights were so bright that I couldn't see the stars at night. I would walk to breakfast in the morning, looking for them, and I would see one or two poking out here and there. And I would imagine what they looked like, all the stars out there. And now, I can take the time to appreciate them. There's all sorts of little beautiful things around you. When the world is ugly, not accepting of who you are, when everything seems against you, try to take time to notice the little things and be happy about who you are, what you're doing, and where you're going. So that's my take on today. Smile. It'll get better. For now, I'm Eric. This has been another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I will see you all later. Right. 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 Right.